the case was a 39 year old hypertensive male presented with new onset type 2 diabetes this lipid shows triglyceride of 270 mg percentage hdl is 33 and ldl is 122 rojuvastatin 10 20 mg was started apart from evidence based optimal medical therapy for comorbidities the most important aspect of lifestyle modification would be so this is a topic and we are we have uh, two international speakers on this uh, uh, topics one of romit bhattacharya from usa and uh, second is dr silpi mohan so i invited first dr romit bhattacharya the topic was already invited this is very intriguing the the cases we see day in day out i have to introduce the speaker a diabetic hypertensive young guy and how we risk stratify triage and and how do we best manage and what is the role of ai because ai is exposing ai to the biological process and then making it learn the deep neural uh, networks and then helping us risk triaging and stratify and tailoring the therapy the first speaker is is dr romit bhattacharya um Uh, I invite him for his exposition on higher genetic susceptibility in Asian Indian warrants a more personalized dietary and lifestyle modification compared to Caucasian. Of course, how he puts his uh, point forth, uh, Dr. Romit, uh, all yours. Signs to me that that higher genetic susceptibility in Asian Indians warrants a more personalized dietary and lifestyle modification approach. And with that, I'll jump right into the content. So the primary prevention of ASCVD uh, in a patient with early onset type 2 diabetes is the case that we're discussing today. It's a 39-year-old gentleman uh, who's hypertensive, who's presented with new onset type 1 diabetes. Their lipid panel reveals a triglyceride level of 270 milligrams per deciliter, an HDL that's low at 33 milligrams per deciliter, and an LDL that's moderate to high f 122 mg per deciliter we can talk about why i might call that high he started on 20 mg of rosuvastatin and the question posed to us is apart from optimal medical therapy for comorbidities <clears throat> the most important aspect of lifestyle modification would be what well i'll back up and just tell you a little bit about what i do I study the interaction between genomic and lifestyle risk factors for cardiometabolic diseases. At Harvard's Massachusetts General Hospital, I'm a clinical cardiologist and preventive cardiologist. I work across the ICU, the cardiology wards, the consult team. I have my own clinic of preventive cardiology as well as running a lifestyle intervention clinic where we focus on improving patients' diet, exercise, stress, sleep, smoking, lipids, blood pressure through lifestyle approaches. And then during my time at the Broad Institute, co-run by Massachusetts General Hospital, Harvard and MIT, I study the genomic uh influences on cardiovascular disease. We also use big data models to integrate wearable data and technology data into our analyses to better characterize people's true lifestyle behaviors. As part of this, we've recently launched the Our Health study. a first of its kind genome first approach to understanding health and disease in south asians uh individuals of south asian ancestry who live in the united states can go to ourhealthstudy.org and then they can fill out a few surveys about their personal and family health history and then we mail them a saliva collection kit that they can deposit their their uh sample in and then and then mail that back to the broad institute where we perform both whole genome and whole exome sequencing This we believe will, will lead to a powerful discovery cohort that merges electronic health record data with imaging data, with wearable data and genomic data. The reason why we launched this effort was because while South Asians are well represented as scientists and doctors and they represent over 23% of the global population, they're dramatically underrepresented in genetic studies. showing less than 1.3% of genetic study participants internationally 
This means that we are unable to, under, to understand the root causes as to why South Asians have such high rates of cardiovascular disease. And in fact, we know they do. So South Asians have two to fourfold increase in uh, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease compared to Europeans. And traditional cardiovascular risk factors like blood pressure, lipids, smoking, and diabetes alone do not explain this risk. Here we looked at, looked at the predicted ASCVD risk between South Asians and Europeans in the UK Biobank, and the predicted risks nearly were completely overlapping with no statistical difference between the two. And yet, when you look at the follow-up time over 12 years, you see that South Asians outpaced Europeans nearly twofold in terms of their uh, incidence of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. And in fact, even when we try to statistically adjust for every known cardiovascular risk factor, we can't fully explain the risk. For instance, if we just adjust for age, sex, and enrollment center, South Asians in this cohort had a twofold risk of cardiovascular disease. If we add hypertension, diabetes, and CKD, uh, chronic kidney disease, still have 1.53 times the, the risk of uh, cardiovascular disease. If we additionally add chronic inflammatory disorders, female reproductive disorders, obesity measures, central adiposity, LDL, HDL, triglycerides, and lipoprotein A, we still are at about 1.43 uh, fold hazard. And if we then add inflammatory factors like C-reactive protein, family history of heart disease, current smoking, dietary spores, sedentary time, psychosocial stressors, and socioeconomic measures, we still remain about 1.5 fold increased risk. And the risk for diabetes is even worse. We, found, we find that South Asians have up to six times the increased risk of diabetes, but with around two-thirds of those who have, with, uh, with diabetes having a BMI less than 30. So we see here that South Asians as a whole have about four times the risk of diabetes compared to Europeans in this cohort, with Bangladeshis having a 30% incidence of diabetes in this cohort. And even among those with diabetes, South Asians, 67%, 68% of them were not obese. So what we learn is that South Asian diaspora faces a two to four times increased risk of CVD with up to six times the risk of diabetes at lower weights and BMIs than their European counterparts. So could genetics be playing a role here? What do we know, know about genetics? I've just told you that we're dramatically underrepresented, we're dramatically understudied. Well, we know that certain traits like body, body habitus have long been known to be heritable. And yet, we sequenced the, the human genome in 2001, we didn't find the answers. So, okay, it wasn't like Mendel's peas, like one gene controls one trait. So we knew, even from, you know, this is a study from, from Scandinavia in 1976, that monozygotic twins had similar body habitus, whereas dizygotic twins had uh, different body habitus. And yet we couldn't find the gene for body habitus, where you store fat. Well, that discovery wouldn't come until many years later, when computational power and genomic sequencing technologies advanced to the point where we could look at not just one gene for one trait, but millions of genes for one trait. What we realized is that it was relatively easy to discover whether a gene increased or decreased the likelihood of having a disease by 0.05% or 0.003%. But that's unlikely to explain why, that, why a patient develops that disease. And yet, if you add millions of such variants together, either not having the variant, having one copy of the variant, or having two copies of the variant, you could give everybody a score for how many variants they have and whether that's slightly or increasing or decreasing the risk for disease. And that's exactly what a polygenic risk score is. So you take the beta coefficient, meaning the hazard ratio co conferred by having that variant. You say, what is the dosage? Does that patient have zero uh, copies of that variant, one copy or two copies of that variant? And you sum it across all known variants that affect the trait. In this case, we're talking about cardi uh, cardiovascular disease. So everybody on the planet will either have zero of these, let's say, 6.6 .6 million variants, or all 6.6 .6 million variants. And they'll have a dosage of each one. And then you can put everybody on a standard distribution, with average being a score in the middle, and then you can look at the percentile score of their genetic risk, their polygenic risk for coronary artery disease. You can see that as their percentile score increases, their prevalence of CAD dramatically increases, especially in the top 20%. So much so that they have three, four, five, six fold increased risk uh, of, uh, of developing coronary artery disease if they have a high polygenic risk. And you can see that not only is their risk of developing coronary disease higher, they develop it at younger ages. Hmm. Well, this sounds kind of like the South Asian problem. South Asians are developing coronary disease at younger ages, they're developing diabetes at younger ages, and they have a higher prevalence. So is it all just lifestyle or is there something genetic here? Well, we know that polygenic risk scores help us to understand inheritance as probability, right? Here we look at the feared BRCA mutations for breast cancer and ovarian cancer. 
And we see that if somebody does not have a BRCA mutation, wow, their polygenic risk score still influences their risk of developing disease. And as you get to higher polygenic risk levels, their risk really increases. But add to that the BRCA mutation, and boom, now all of a sudden you see that, wow, even if you're in the top 50% of the, of the uh, polygenic risk, the BRCA mutation dramatically increases your risk. The same thing is true of Lynch syndrome for colon cancer, and the same thing is true for familial hypercholesterolemia variants. So we can see that your polygenic risk may modify your risk of developing disease when you get hit with an additional insult. So we learn that genetics are statistics. So then how can we merge what, what, we, what we know about the epidemiology of South Asian cardiovascular disease with the genetics? Well, the Masala study was one such study that helped us understand this. Well, they said, wow, one of the biggest differences that we see in South Asians who are at risk for cardiovascular disease is that even at a normal weight compared to whites, Chinese, African-Americans, and Hispanic population in the US, South Asians, 40% of them at normal weight had metabolic abnormalities, including high fasting glucose, low HDL, high triglycerides, and hypertension. This is exactly our patient, right? So they have this metabolic abnormality phenotype, even at normal weights. I know at overweight and obese weights, many, many individuals have these metabolic abnormalities, but South Asians develop them at normal weights. And we know that this is true. You know, it, it, this uh, famous paper, <laughs> really letter, research letter published in The Lancet in 2004, established the yajnik yudnik paradox, where Yajnik and Yudnik were two research partners who published many papers together. It turns out they had the same BMI at 22.3, However, their body fat percentages dramatically differed on DEXA scanning. Now, of course, now, of course lifestyle may be relevant. The second author runs marathons, whereas the first author's main exercise, this is a quote from the paper, the second author runs marathons, whereas the first author's main exercise is running to beat the closing doors of the elevator in the hospital every morning. And yet, the contribution of genes Hello. in adiposity at the there? time in 2004 was yet to be determined. Well, we also know, looking at the Masala study, that South Asians deposit more adipose tissue in depots associated with increased card cardiovascular risk. They have lower hepatic attenuation than other races, meaning that there's more liver fat deposition. They have higher visceral fat storage than other races. They have higher intramuscular fat storage than other races. And they have lower total lean body mass. But wait, we've actually discovered from our group that obesity and fat deposition, these are the major risk factors for South, South Asian cardiovascular disease, have strong polygenic inheritance. Here you can see that patients who have a low polygenic risk score uh, for obesity do not go on to develop obesity, whereas those who have a high polygenic risk score go on to develop obesity at high rates. Similarly, using machine learning models, we were able to identify uh, individuals on, uh, on MRI who store visceral fat, uh, fat abdominal uh, subcutaneous fat, and gluteofemoral fat. And we found that these were strongly polygenically determined. And in fact, if you stored more visceral fat, your risk of type 2 diabetes and coronary disease, there's an identical graph in this paper for coronary disease, uh, increases dramatically. And if you store your fat in your gluteofemoral depots, you tend to be protected. So the more you tend to shift that fat storage over the gluteofemoral depots, you're, you're more protected. So including genetic risk alleles, not just for CAD, but also blood pressure, lipids, obesity, improves risk, risk prediction in South Asians more than any other group. We see this as we have evolved our polygenic risk scores across the original 2018 uh, risk score to the 2024 risk scores, and our prediction ability improves as we incorporate the genetic predisposition for fat deposition, for hypertension, for, lipid, for uh, uh, lipid abnormalities, for uh, diastolic hypertension, all of these things. And in fact, newer genetic methods can use these scores to actually infer the pathophysiologic processes by, with, by, by which diseases develop. So this is, a, uh, this is work done by Udler and, and others uh, at the Broad Institute, published in Nature, Nature Genetics, and they found that there were several different beta cell dysfunction phenotypes that led to diabetes. There was uh, obesity phenotypes, hyperinsulinemia uh, phenotypes, and lipodystrophy phenotypes that all led to diabetes. But the disease of diabetes was probably reached through slightly different pathophysiologic mechanisms. This speaks to the diversity of the disease within a single disease entity or name. And in fact, they went on to say that, wow, when we looked at these 1.4 million individuals that were, uh, that, that were reanalyzed from 37 published type 2, uh, type 2 diabetes genome-wide association studies, we found that South Asians, mathematically modeled, had the highest uh, relationship between BMI and probability of developing type 2 diabetes. And in fact, they said that you know, uh, among these subgroups, it seemed like they had decreased insulin secretion, decreased lean muscle mass, or ectopic fat deposition in the lean muscle tissue. And this may have been uh, a reason why South Asians were developing diabetes at such low BMIs. However, they found that beta cell dysfunction and lipodystrophy phenotypes and obesity phenotypes were the most common reasons for South Asians' premature development of diabetes. So how does this affect our management, management strategy? Well, firstly, we know that those at the greatest genetic risk also benefit the most from lifestyle changes. This is a, a, a pivotal study in 2016 that showed that if you bin individuals into low, intermediate, and high polygenic risk for coronary artery disease, you find that those at favorable risk in the blue 
are most improved from those in unfavorable risk in the red if you are at highest genetic risk. And in fact, those at highest genetic risk can bring their risk down from being uh, much higher than, than others to comparable to those at the lowest genetic risk simply by living a, a healthy lifestyle. In, and additionally, recently, just uh, this year, uh, in Cell Metabolism, a, a paper was published showing that lifestyle can add risk additionally to those at high genetic risk. So just like we saw for the BRCA mutation, we see that those who are at high polygenic risk, when you add a poor lifestyle to their, to, uh, to their genetic risk, that is a multiplier effect and dramatically increases their risk. So we need to be paying attention to people's polygenic risk when we're counseling them about the importance of lifestyle efforts. Whereas if you're at low polygenic risk, you know, living a poor lifestyle doesn't actually increase your risk that much. We also know that disclosing high polygenic risk scores to patients reduces the risk of ASCVD at 10 years and improves adherence. This is a, a MedArchive uh, uh, pre-publication of the MI genes uh, clin randomized clinical trial at 10 years of follow-up. And they found that if you disclosed an integrated risk score, including a polygenic risk and Framingham risk score, they found that patients had fewer ASCVD events, statistically significant, across 10 years of follow-up. Their non-HDL cholesterol levels, as well as all other cholesterol levels and, 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 measured, uh, and measured risk factors were better controlled over time. And you found that they had a higher adherence to statin therapy across 10 years. Is this because patients are taking this information and actually internalizing that and understanding, wow, if I'm at higher risk, I need to be more responsible. And the South Asian plates are not well balanced for, ma for macronutrients, but they have the potential to be very healthy. You know, we can switch from processed carbohydrates and fried snacks, sweets, high calorie, high saturated fat foods with lots of sweets and desserts to a plant forward diet, with fruits and vegetables, healthy spices, and less processed, you know, or the, we are the original farm to tables type of, type of diet. And so if patients know patients that they're really really high risk, 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 we would also encourage individuals at high risk of diabetes to strengthen and, strength, 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 and be encouraged and to build muscle, muscle, which muscle. we have, have seen uh, in uh, a study out of Stanford, show that strength training actually improved uh, A1C more than aerobic training alone. And certainly a combination of both is very beneficial. And we know that South Asians respond similarly to growth stimuli to white Europeans when they do strength train. And lastly, I, I know this is about lifestyle and, and behavior that we're talking about, but we are now in the era of gene genetically informed therapies. And if we don't have genetic data on South Asians, we will be left behind by the age of biomedicine. So lastly, returning to our patient, our 39-year-old hypertensive male presenting with nuance at type 1 diabetes, high, high uh, triglycerides, low HDL, and a moderate LDL. Aside from OMT, I would say that understanding his pathophysiology, we would recommend a balanced macronutrient diet with lower carbohydrates and increased protein. We would recommend strength training and aerobic exercise, particularly walking after meals with a goal towards weight loss and glucose control. In future, we would hope to disclose PRS scoring as well as cascade screening of his family members to mo motivate him and his family members to understand if I'm at higher risk, my lifestyle efforts are really, really important. And we would target diabetes therapy to the patient's unique pathophysiology. I believe that may come to be the future standard of care. If you're a hy hyperinsulin phenotype, then maybe you actually need to be reducing your insulin resistance using a GLP. Whereas if you are a uh, hypoinsulin phenotype and you have beta cell dysfunction, maybe an insulin secretagogue will be helpful. And in conclusion, I just say, you know, this old saying, genetics loads the gun, lifestyle pulls the trigger. So we need to understand patients' underlying risk in order to really help them, mo help motivate them to make these lifestyle changes. Genetics are already actionable. They help us understand the pathophysiology, target therapies. They help us guide effort and motivate patients. And Asian Indian patients are at particularly high risk and can benefit greatly from an understanding of genetics to guide lifestyle therapeutics. And with that, I'll take, I'll, uh, take any questions. Uh, please follow me on Twitter, RomithBMD. Uh, and uh, this is my email, this is my lab, and the support, supportive group that has helped with the Our Health study. Thank you very much. Our topic is technology-driven lifestyle intervention, dietary modifications, and psychological care are more important for a Asian subset, and we'll be following the same case scenario. Thank you. So good morning, everyone. Uh, am I audible? Yes. So first of all, I would like to thank Dr. Kamal Sharma for giving me the opportunity to address this August gathering and to pitch me against none other than Dr. Romit Bhattacharya. So I stand here for technology-driven lifestyle intervention, dietary modification, uh, psychological support to all, and effective strategy to tackle CBD in genetically susceptible Asian subset. I would like to start with this quote by Dr. Ted Ross. Harnessing the power of digital technology is essential for achieving universal health coverage. Ultimately, digital technologies are not end in themselves. They are vital tools to promote health, keep the world safe, and serve the vulnerable. This patient who has come to me is a 39-year-old hypertensive. 
new onset diabetic and he has lipid disorder and I have optimized him on medical therapy. Now the question is what I'm going to do next. The core components of cardiac rehabilitation includes blood pressure management, lipid management, diabetes management, then giving them uh, uh, advice regarding tobacco cessation, psychosocial management, and physical activity counseling. And we definitely know that healthy, life, uh, healthy lifestyle or healthy life behavior definitely decreases the risk of developing CVD and has associated benefit of giving a good quality of life. But what are the fundamental challenges that we face in delivering the long-term optimal care in such patients. The challenges include their varying risk factors, differing lifestyle food habits, socioeconomic conditions, aging population, early onset disease, constraints in healthcare workforce, lack of follow-up, and service delivery. And what are the potential solutions in the present scenario? Patient self-care empowerment are increasingly becoming important. We have to enhance the usage of digital healthcare technologies, precision in diagnosis as has been pointed out by Dr. Romit Bhattacharya, and providing optimal and technology-driven lifestyle changes to all. How can we create the efficiency in CAT care pathway? We can better integrate heterogeneous medical devices, use uh, user-friendly technological interfaces, increased automation of manual processes, improve standardization of the entire process, increase utilization of uh, health information exchange, and seamless portability of information. Now the question is, precision therapy or technology-driven lifestyle modification for all? We all know that atherosclerosis is a disease which has got a very strong genetic predisposition but is modifiable by lifestyle. And genetics and environment, they play role together to funnel further enhance the risk. I would like to bring to your notice this slide, which shows that the totality of exposure from conception throughout the life course leads to multiple physiological changes in an individual. And these damages which play a role in, uh, in health and chronic diseases. Genetic risk stratification definitely is superior to conventional risk stratification for primary prevention of coronary artery disease, but clinical trials have shown that 40 to 50 percent of patients can be reduced by lifestyle, physical activity, and proper usage of drugs. This study, which has been published by Dr. Romit Bhattacharya, and as he has mentioned, that polygenic risk score increases the accuracy of cardiovascular risk prediction. I agree with that. And personalized intervention is definitely useful because we can risk stratify into high intermediate and uh, high risk group, and then we can th give them individualized treatment. I would bring to your notice Masala study, and the findings underscore the importance of maintaining ideal cardiovascular health regardless of ethnicity. And it has shown that there is a uh, strong association with, uh, between life simple seven matrix and coronary artery calcium incidence and progression. And irrespective of any ethnicity, we have to look into the lifestyle and uh, correct that. Again, this study uh, published in NEGM, it has shown that favorable lifestyle is associated with 50% lower risk, relative risk correction of coronary artery disease. So. Being in India, being in a developing country, do we invest our resources in genetic analysis or motivate usage of technology-driven intervention for all? See, uh, as we all know that uh, technology is one of the biggest uh, uh, invention of humankind. And as the mobile usage and other things are increasing, it has made us sedentary and it has uh, increased the lifestyle diseases. This is a bane, but the thing is, we can convert into a boon because in India, right from the topmost person to the rickshaw puller, everybody has got a smartphone. And if we integrate this, uh, this possibility and if we integrate healthcare apps in uh, all of them, we can definitely percolate this information to one and all. And definitely we can convert this uh, bane into a boon.
right from the beginning or now? Now. now. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> yeah, so I'll continue with that. So the thing is, what are the potentials of digital healthcare intervention for CBD? It empowers patient and the uh, care provider. It reduces healthcare cost. If we go into the genetics, definitely the risk, uh, the cost escalation would be there, especially in a developing country like India. It promotes universal health service coverages, improves patient experience of care, and improves long-term patient outcome. Thank you so much. Yeah, and as we see that in last decade or so, there is a definitely increase in digital health market. It is growing by almost 30% per year. This study, which is published in JACC, shows the ecosystem which works between the patient and the caregiver who are connected by the app. The data goes to the remote processing center. The analysis is done, which goes to the doctor, as well as the information goes to the patient. And not just that, these informations can be collected and can be utilized for research facility as well in future. So this, this slide is very important, not just for this patient. What I want to highlight that if we pull this data, definitely by AI, we can, get, uh, we can get new set of data, hidden patterns, and learn better action uh, in future. And it has the potential to assist in prevention, detection, and intervention in coronary artery disease. These are the various apps which are available, not just healthcare apps, medical apps, mental health apps, fitness apps, telepharmacy apps, and whatnot. And these are the various parameters, just for an example, which we can get from just a watch. One such app is LIFE Digital Therapeutic Ecosystem, where the LIFE patient has an app. Uh, again, the caregiver has one app. It is Bluetooth enabled and the information is uh, uh, obtained by the experienced team of cardiac rehabilitation specialist, and this app is also connected to the doctor, and we get the desired outcomes. <laughs> Lifey device awareness and lifestyle changes uh, definitely integrates and gives a multi multidisciplinary team to the, um, to the patient, and it is customized, the dashboard is customized according to the patient, and emergency services are also provided. I request I should get few minutes because of the lack of the coordination. Uh, these are the various uh, uh, studies, and I would like to quote from one of the study, digital therapeutics build a lucrative bridge to help cardiovascular patient cross over into improved quality of life in place of traditional face-to-face -face CR regimes. And this again uh, study shows that there is a definite advantage over traditional interventions and by automatic uh, tracking of real-time data and two-way communication outside the traditional appointment-based healthcare model is definitely effective uh, in delivering a better cardiac care. Digital Twin, uh, which is a one-year randomized control trial, again showed that by using a virtual platform and by, con uh, by creating a digital twin, we can get better blood pressure control, antihypertensive medical reduction, and remission of hypertension as well. These are the various comparable devices which has different capabilities, right from smartwatch, fitness tracker, chest strap tracker, uh, smart clothing, blood pressure monitoring. And studies have shown that remote monitoring and using these technologies have reduced hospital readmission, improved fitness, improved diet, and also helps in uh, better blood pressure and uh, diabetes control. Anything we use in life, anything we want to do in life, always we do a SWOT analysis, whether we want to go ahead with that or not. So if we do the SWOT analysis of uh, technology-driven lifestyle intervention, the strengths are it enhances the quality of care delivery for all the patients, it improves patient centricity, it enables distributed and hybrid care. Patient can come to the clinic, it, it, even in remote we can take care of them. It develops innovative healthcare ecosystem, it enhances patient satisfaction because he can see what he is doing, how many steps he is uh, walking Recording in progress. Uh, and it improves patient data record and reassessment. The weaknesses include lack of national guidelines, lack of digital literacy, 
lack of perceived effectiveness of DHI, lack of common standards, various apps are there, limited infrastructure, loss of privacy of data, as well as, last but not the least, added burden of me on medical staff and data for assessment of those. <laughs> the opportunities include better availability of tool, lucid data analysis, and be better patient compliance. The threats include data-related threats and lack of follow-up and effect on doctor-patient one-to-one relationship. So I would like to conclude by saying, South Asian predisposition to CAD due to high genetic risk, erratic lifestyle, and unfavorable conditions make early introduction of technology interventions to all not a possibility, but an inevitability. Thank you for your patient listening. So everything uh, we listened about uh, technology and how these uh, uh, ever-increasing technological access and AI and deep learning, machine learning models can help in future. But may I ask Dr. Shilpi how, uh, it's not available, how this technology or whatever you said here can help a patient, uh, index patient in the case he's diabetic uh, hypertensive and is under 40 and is Rosewurst on Rosewurst in 20, and LDL is way about it's a kind of an atherogenic diabetic dyslipidemia. How, uh, Dr. Patacha, or you, uh, this technology and this awareness about that we being in a very high risk race can help? How can he adopt this, and what amendments in lifestyle can he, uh, or we can help him choose right drugs in an algorithmic way so that he reaches to his all goes lipids, blood pressure, and, and cholesterol? Uh, thank you for this question. See, this patient has come to me. We already know that he has diabetes, hypertension, and dyslipidemia. The thing is, I would give him the proper counseling as I started in my first slide, that I would counsel him that these risk factors are there. Maybe you have a family history as well. So Hello. these risk factors will definitely uh, play I a role. Although right now you don't have a myocardial infarction, but in future you uh, can have. So what you need to do is you should have your app on the mobile as well as on the phone, which like can help you in getting work. how much steps you are uh, walking per day. So at least I will tell him at least 8,000 uh, steps at least you take each day. 10,000 is a good distance. And then you can check your diabetes also by using the sensors. and. Periodic follow up for periodic uh, follow up if you can come fine, otherwise these data will come to me and then I will analyze or my team uh, will analyze and then will guide you. So the patient will feel Many confident the that yes, that, uh, the doctor is in touch with me and I feel confident that he is seeing what, what he is getting and he will be more motivated to do because uh, he will get the right air pollution response. Are they exposed to? I know in, um, in many parts of India that's, that, that's a huge yeah, a issue. And so those are those not the things that we, we are necessarily able to change by encouraging people to, uh, you know, use an app differently or, or that kind of thing. Uh, by contrast, uh, I would say that therapies that are, you can, that can be disseminated as a pill so that the therapy is uniform or as an injection, the therapy is uniform. You can, you can adjust them and give them once at a time. They are much easier to deploy in a global context across all different contexts and with a relatively less effort on the on the path of the patient. So um, in that in that regard, I think that genetically informed therapies are extraordinarily potent in that you know that you are particularly inhibiting or augmenting a particular biological process, and that does have a lot of a lot of merit. Uh, in regards to this particular discussion, we're really focusing on lifestyle and behavior. And the question of whether genetics can influence lifestyle behavior, I think really the biggest thing is can it influence people to change their behavior? And I think when we try to tell everybody everywhere all at once that they should be eating better and exercising, oftentimes that message lands on deaf ears because people only have a certain amount of bandwidth in their day be able to put effort behind their health behaviors. However, when you tell them that you specifically are at higher risk and you're able to share that information about them in particular, or even more so about their children to say that your children are at higher risk, it would be really helpful for them if they made these particular changes, if they ate in this particular way, if they exercised in this way, um, if they slept in this way, if they were able to uh, rest and recover in this way, then uh, 
people feel that, that, they, that that advice is targeted towards them. And this is the holy grail of personalized medicine. We haven't yet been able to realize, and today is not a reality yet. But uh, I very much hope that that will be a reality in the future. And we're working very hard towards that reality. So uh, thank you very much. Um, great. Thank you. I think both uh, genetic, counsel genetic uh, counseling as well as uh, health driven by this uh, modern technologies, both are important in their own ways. And uh, I personally use this life application in my patients and finding good uh, results. And uh, we as a cardiologist not only uh, treat our patients, but we have to do uh, primary prevention of their relatives as well. So I think that way. See, the thing is, even if we do the genetic analysis, especially in a country like India, we are adding to the cost. That is number one. On top of it, even if we say that you are a low risk patient, high risk, okay, we will tell him, okay, you are high risk, okay, you be very careful. Even if he is a low risk, we cannot say that, okay, go have rasgulla every day. So <laughs> that is the point. So it is better to give him an app and then take him ahead in, uh, in the futures to come. Thank you. Wouldn't Dr. Shapi, uh, can we consider, given the incidence which is um, obnoxiously increasing and percolating down to lower decades, 20s and 30s, and we are witnessing SCDs like anything, we consider an Indian race laden with risk factor, constellation of cardiovascular risk factor as a high risk, forget about genetics. We do it, we consider it too that we are high risk. And patient like this, Dr. Kamal drafted, diabetic hypertensive, and on 20, which is moderate to high dose, and yet, yet not dropping. Uh, I think we have to go on guns blazing without putting any additional thing because it's extremely high risk of major adverse cardiovascular and cerebrovascular events. So rather than technology and all, of course technology does help in assuring lifestyle adherences and persistences. We, 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 we think that he is on GDMT for all structural and functional comorbidities. And, uh, and I know that my, one of the questions. Uh, Sani is here. It's L LDL is way above 120 over uh, 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 on, on, on Rosa Western in 20. Uh, can can AI help diagnose familial hypertriclosidemia, which is prevalent in a country which which we don't see, um, we don't do cascade screening for that. So is this is a possibility in this in next case of familial hypercholesterolemia heterogeneous, in spite of being on 20 before ushering into incremental high-intensity lipid lowering over and above high-intensity statin. This, the, because it's AI-based symposia, so can AI help in that, in risk triaging? Yes, definitely. The more we go into the details, more information we are going to get. More information we are going to get, then we can implement that in the future course of action. Definitely that can be done. Comments from the moderators, Dr. Komal, Dr. Kinneri. So I have a like couple of questions, but one prime central question would be, we have been knowing this conventional factors, conventional risk factors, they explain majority of the risk. How much risk are we ex expecting genetic factor to be explaining? Like 80% of the risk is because of diet, dyslipidemia, sedentary lifestyle, and all those things. Are we expecting genetic factor to be explaining 20% of the risk, or is it just a nominal thing? I uh, think the, the slide is, is uh, uh, there. I've displayed that slide. Pardon? I've displayed that slide, what percentage was our question. So, yeah, for CAD, maybe not. That's a valid point. But dyslipidemia, you can do a sequencing and get 60, 80% yield. Morphins, 90 to 95%. Cardiomyopathies, maybe 20, 30%. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathies, maybe more. But even when HCM, where a lot of genetic stuff is thought to be, it's not more than 50%. So, point is very valid. That's One of the slides in Dr. Rohit was very good. If you have genetic risk and if you adhere to lifestyle, you respond very well to the lifestyle changes. Exactly. I just saw the slide. And if you have genetic risk and if you don't adhere to the lifestyle amendments, you have the, uh, your, it's a harbinger of a very ominous prognosis. A very good slide. So it, it so correlates with this thing. Yeah, so but that's in spite of all this, we still don't predict STDs well in India. All, all these, are, of course, for channelopathies and in this video, we have predictions. But for CAD related events, it's still a big elusive enigma. True. And that's where I guess role of because epigenetics comes into picture. Yes. Yeah. Role of epigenetics comes into picture. And I guess we don't have majority of the Indian representative data in yeah. that the PRS scoring system. That's been brought out by Dr. Romit that India is under, South Asia is underrepresented. Definitely. True. Thank you.
Good session, good discussion. Any question from audience? I think the session is closed for that. Hello. So we have our lunch break for half an hour. Thank you so much, all chairpersons and Dr. Shilpi. Kindly connect the moment of.